I learned these words when I was a child, listening to the liturgy from communion that was used in those days. The same liturgy that had been used since the 17th century. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. It's called the prayer of humble access. Some of you, I'm sure, heard it and recited it along with your pastor, either as a child or in years gone by. That passage, that prayer of humble access, is taken from the lesson we just read, which I believe is one of the hardest lessons in all of Scripture especially this week as we read it following what Jesus just said last week. It's not what goes into a person that defiles them. It's what comes out of their mouth and what comes out of their heart. We're not used to hearing such nasty things come out of the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to take some time this morning to unpack this. Even though this is not a table fellowship sort of story, this isn't about Jesus sitting down to eat. There's a table in it. And the image is very stark and striking for us. I thought about putting a map up here for you, but biblical maps sort of kind of go blurring by people sometimes. But the regions of Tyre and Sidon are very far to the north of Galilee where Jesus has been in ministry. We're not sure why he's even there, but the people there were in enmity with the Jews, very much so, both ways. But Jews particularly were being abused in that area because they were far from Galilee. They were far from Jerusalem and the holy city. They were far out of their own territory. And the territory here we read of a Canaanite woman. Not a name that was even used anymore. Now, if you look at this in the other gospel, in Mark's gospel, she's called a Syrophoenician woman, which means she's a woman who is not a Jew and very influenced by the Greek culture around her. Again, a culture that was very hard on the Jewish population in their region. We're not quite sure why Jesus is there, but he is the outsider. But look at what happens. Let's look again at the lesson that we read. A Canaanite woman from that region came and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. Lord, son of David. This is a woman who is not a Jew but knows exactly who this is. This is the Messiah, the promised one of God. And her daughter is possessed by a demon. And she goes to him knowing from what she's heard, or what she's felt, or what she's seen in him, that he is the one who can help her when no one else can, that this man is truly from God. But what does Jesus do? He ignores her completely, acts as if she's not there. And the disciples apparently didn't listen to what he said the week before, not that he listened to what he said, what we read last week either, because they said to him, get rid of her, get her out of here, so she stops bothering us. Here is someone who is in need of healing for her child, not even herself. She's not coming on her own behalf. She's coming for her child. And anyone here who has had a child or a grandchild and watched them in illness or in injury knows that there's very little you wouldn't do. There ain't no mountain high enough to keep you from getting to the help that you need for that child. And she comes then. And his answer was, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, saying, you're not one of us. Get away from here. You're not one of us. Now remember, this is Matthew's gospel, and I said last week that Matthew was a Jew writing to Jews, saying this is the fulfillment of what God has promised. This is our Messiah who's coming. But if you remember how Matthew's gospel begins, there are those travelers from the east, not Jews, but they recognize who he is when King Herod doesn't even recognize him. This is not the first time someone outside the community of faith has recognized Jesus. But this is a woman who had no social standing in either culture, and she's daring to approach him. And he says to her, you are not one of us. I have nothing to do with you. And then it gets worse. She kneels before him. She looks him in the face and says, Lord, help me. And Jesus says something so unimaginable to us that it's hard to even put these ideas into words. It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She's gone from outsider to dog. 
But the woman is not at all intimidated by that. She doesn't say, how dare you call me a dog? She says, all right, but if I am a dog, then let me just eat the crumbs under the table. And Jesus is moved by that demonstration of faith. And he says to her, wow, your faith is astounding. It's going to happen as you said. He doesn't have to go. She knows he doesn't have to travel to where her daughter is. She knows all he needs to do is speak it or think it and it's going to happen. And her child will be healed. Hard lesson. We could try to pretend that Jesus was just putting on a show to see if his disciples would get the lesson. But I don't think that's what this is about. I have studied this passage so long and so hard for so many years and I read more commentaries just in the past two weeks about this lesson, trying to find someone who would say, no, this is Jesus just trying to get them to look at the thing the right way. But no, it's not. It's Jesus saying to this woman, I don't know if he's tired. I don't know if he's just worn out from his travels. I don't know what it is. But Jesus says to her, go away. It's not your turn. But she reminds him, I do believe in her, please. She reminds him that his promises are for everyone. He doesn't think it's that time yet, but apparently the world is going to come to him. Just like those travelers from the east came and brought him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh when he was too young to know what was happening. This woman knows fully who he is, and she's gets on her knees and she calls him Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus' heart is moved toward her. So what does this say to us? Because we're probably as close to a Canaanite as you can be in the 21st century. Here we are in another nation. We did not come through circumcision. We did not come through the Jewish faith. We came to Christ through the witness of the Apostle Paul to Lydia in Europe, where we came to Christ through the proclamation of the missionaries who traveled around the world, those from Portugal and those from the colonies of the United States who traveled the world to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We come from those of the Coptic tradition who traveled into sub-Saharan Africa and shared the word. We come from a variety of places, but we are outsiders. But we are the fulfillment of the promise that one day the whole world would come to Christ. So what does it say to us? But be careful who you exclude. Be careful who you think is unwelcome at the meal because Jesus found someone whose faith astounded him. And through her faith, her daughter was healed. And through her faith, she found a place at the table. It amazes me sometimes what people will say about who's in and who's out when it comes to heaven, as if they had the guest list, as if they were the ones who got to decide that. And people will say to me, oh, scripturally, you know, this person's not going to get there and that person's not going to get there and this person's in and this person's out. And I say to them, that is way above my pay grade. My job is to welcome people to the meal and hope I can lead them to eat and see how good God's love is, that they can understand that regardless of their sin or their shame or what they've done or who they've been, that they have the chance to have something new and whole and right before God through Christ and Christ alone. It's not the first time God's mind has been changed. Look at the great, 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 or how many greats it was, grandmother of our Lord Jesus Christ, Ruth the Moabite woman. Moabites were so accursed of God, they couldn't even become Jews. They couldn't be a proselyte. They couldn't come into the fold. And yet, when Ruth looks at her mother-in-law, Naomi, who says, go home, I'm not going to have children. I, I'm an old woman. I can't have another son for you to marry. Go home to your own people. She says, where you go, I will go. Where you make your home, I will make my home. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. And God's heart was moved, and she became the grandmother of King David. And thus, the ancestor of our Lord Jesus Christ. John's Gospel will tell the story of a woman sitting by a well, a Samaritan, 
His disciples are astounded that he's talking to her. And she is the one that he is the first to say to her, I am the one that has been promised. And in spite of her shame and in spite of the people who have rejected her in her own town, she runs to tell them the news that she has seen the man who is the Messiah and the Savior and bids them come to welcome him as well. Humbles you, doesn't it? Because truth be told, we're probably more like these outsiders than we hope to be because of our own sin and our own mistakes and our own willfulness and stubbornness, our own greed, our own avarice. And yet, God has found a place for us at the table. And God calls us to welcome others. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. Those were words I said every time I had communion as a child. They're words that found their way into my heart and into my soul. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. <sighs> mercy compassion, love. Uh, it was my great pleasure this morning to teach our Sunday school lesson to our little ones. We sent them home some matzah. Last week we sent them everything from the Seder. Now our lamb shank bone was really a cookie baked in the shape of the bone, thanks to Gail McGuckin. The egg was not roasted. It was a junior mint egg covered in chocolate. We didn't send them wine. We sent them grape juice boxes, but we sent them plastic wine glasses that they just loved. That, everybody told me that was the best part of the morning. Well, this morning they had another cup, and they had another piece of matzah, and they had another box of juice. And this time we talked about the Last Supper. We talked about that meal, the one that the Prayer of Humble Access was written for because Jesus said, every time you eat this, every time you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. We talked about how at that meal, he said to them, even as they celebrated the Passover, even as they thought, here we are, we're on top of the world because they had just entered Jerusalem. They were celebrating God's redemption of the people from slavery in Egypt. And Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. All of you will desert me. And Peter says, Lord, no matter what the others do, I'll follow you even if it means my death. And he looks at him and he says, Peter, 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 before this night is over, before the sun comes up and the rooster has a chance to crow, you will deny knowing me three times. And yet he feeds them. Just a crumb of his grace is enough. But he feeds them in spite of who they are and what they've done, in spite of what they're about to do. He feeds them. Be careful when you say with certainty that so-and-so will not inherit the kingdom of God. Be careful who you don't want at the table with you. Several years ago, one of my parishioners asked me if I would donate blood. He asked me what my blood type was. I said, I'm A positive. And he said, great. I need someone to donate blood for me. And I said, I would be happy to do that if you need blood. I said, why do you need to donate it ahead of time? He said, because I want to make sure that no one's blood comes into me who is of a different race than I am. I don't want any black blood given to me. When I hear that coming from the mouth of someone who claims Jesus Christ as Savior, it breaks my heart. I said to him, when you get to heaven and you look in there, when you get there through the grace of God, if you see a black face, you're going to turn around and go home. And he said, I just might do that. These are the things that break a pastor's heart. And these are the things that stories like this call us to examine our own hearts and to weed out any prejudice or bigotry we might have toward anybody, whether it be their ethnicity, the color of their skin, the place they were born and raised, the faith that they practiced before coming to Christ, or whether it's their sins, the ones we know about and the ones we assume.
Next week, we'll read the rest of the 15th chapter of Matthew. And we'll see a group of people coming to Christ to be fed. A crowd. And we'll count ourselves among them and we'll count ourselves as blessed. Because we don't come to his table on our righteousness. We come on our knees. And as the woman cried out, cry out to him, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. And Christ will hear you. And Christ will grant you peace. And Christ will bid you welcome for the glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.